Hey folks, uh, thanks for stopping by here. I just wanted to make a quick video uh, as a little part two to the movable shapes video that I made. So in the last video, which I'll link in the description below, um, we worked on some octave movable shapes. And those are the primary way I think about the mandolin. It, it turns the instrument into a very linear one, uh, unlike a whole lot of string instruments. So I try to look at the mandolin a little more linear-like uh, compared to other string instruments. Because it's tuned in fifths, you can do that. And you can move a lot of these shapes around. But it is helpful to know the other shapes and navigational tools on the mandolin. And this is the secondary one I would think of. And I'll call it the Monroe. There's not a great name for it, but it's, it's the chop chord that we use. It's so many of the Monroe licks that we all play. Um, and it and it looks at the fingerboard in this way. Instead of with the octave, we kind of looked at it this way, it looks at it uh, up and down rather than side to side. So there at the beginning, I was just fooling around with a couple of Monroe style licks. Kind of played out of this shape. And if we were to play an arpeggio out of the shape, it would look something like this. And what, the real power comes from connecting this shape and the octave. Uh, because at both the bottom of the octave and the top, you have access to this shape. So I think it's important to be able to connect the two and to be able to play fluently between them. But for the purpose of this lesson, I won't use a tune or a tab or anything like that. Uh, the main idea is to just kind of come up with your own little thing. It can be a lick, a tune, or something, a scale, or an arpeggio. Um, for my purpose, I just like playing these Monroe licks because they're fun to move around. And we're just going to take some ideas and move them around. Just like that. And then, and then towards the end, we're going to work on connecting this with the octave shape. So if you haven't watched the octave video, uh, make sure to go check that out. Um, that's kind of the starting point, I think, for navigating the mandolin the way I think about it. Um, so check that out, and uh, then we'll go ahead and connect the two later on. So take any kind of Monroe licks, anything else that makes sense to you, um, even just some arpeggios. Um, and you can play them, let's say, in C. We'll start in C. Just like that. So with this technique, I'm using my ring finger as a guide rather than my index. I'm playing based off of where my ring finger is. The shapes kind of center around the ring finger. And with the mandolin, we use our index and ring so often, you know, for pentatonic, open scales. Just like that, or, you know. Our ring fingers and index fingers get used nonstop. So I think those are the primary navigational fingers uh, with these shapes and being able to move things around in different keys. So we're going to be leading with our ring finger. And bearing that in mind, we can play something in the key of C here. Just like that. And let's move the idea around. You know, let's go up to F like I was. So all I have to think about here while I'm doing this, I'm not thinking about what these values are, whether I'm thinking about the frets, the notes, anything like that. I'm just finding my root, which here I'm playing an F with this finger, and then everything else snaps into place. So I know, I know the sound I want, and I just know where I have to be to get that sound. Same thing with a minor, you know, some kind of minor arrangement. Just like that. So it, it really doesn't matter to think about the note values here. I mean, you need to know that stuff musically for uh, lots of other scenarios, but for this purpose, we're just moving things around in different keys. Say you're playing a song in a key like B-flat when you're used to playing it in G or A. This is going to help you out tremendously. So after we move that from C to F, we can jump up these strings and go to G. which I'm doing there pretty fluently. It's really not a big leap to be able to play this around in different keys. You know, we can go up to A here. You know, 
B flat. Just like that, and we can play these ideas anywhere using this finger as a guide. So now, if you think you have a pretty good grip on this, which I find most mandolin players do, and you can understand the octave and play out of things and the octave shape around the neck, I think it's important to be able to connect the two. So a good way of practicing that is just start on your lowest note. So my bottom note is going to be this open G, and my top note will be this G, which is the 15th fret, which does seem worlds apart. I mean, that's that's a crazy difference between the two, and it seems like you have to really know the fingerboard to figure that out. But you don't. You just have to know how to find your root notes and use the shapes based out of those roots. So I'm going to start by imagining that my index finger is fretting here where the nut is. And I'm playing out of that octave shape. Just like that. And I can kind of play these arpeggios, just I'm going to play 1, 3, 5 all the way up. Just like that. And that's a more octave shape. We're playing that, which is an octave if we think about it. Uh, it's the same shape, but I don't have to fret because the nut is there. So those are three octave shapes, and they connect one another. Now we can kind of look at it this way. So I have a G here as well, which is the same G that's there. And being able to connect those two is incredibly important for playing uh, more than just the G notes. You know, if we want to play the uh, triads, the arpeggios, the scales, anything like that, it's nice to be able to connect these two shapes. So let's try something like this. So if we go down, or if we go up, just like that, we can come down in this way. And we're using this shape here, which is the same as this shape. And it's based off of uh, fretting our ring finger on the 12th fret and just playing that shape. And we're going to come out of this octave shape up here into that shape and use that open D string to find our way down. So you can start to look around the fingerboard in multiple ways, and I find that a great thing to do is just try and just improvise in G and just cover the entire neck. And once you find a place that doesn't feel comfortable, work on just the scale there. So say I'm improvising in G here. And say this doesn't feel comfortable right here. Well, I'm just going to practice this little range and connecting this and this to this. Uh, and just work on that. And then once this is fluent, start to reincorporate it with everything else. And try that with every key, major, minor, just any idea. Just figure out how to move those shapes around and navigate on your fingerboard. So just using those two shapes, work on playing anywhere and everywhere on your fingerboard. Uh, you'll really be surprised at how much navigation you can get away with without having to think about what notes you're playing. You know, you can just think about, you get the root in the right place, everything else will fall where it, into place where it needs to be.